Hallelujah. I love the music that we had today. It said we built altars in the wilderness, that first song, I believe. And today, that's our message. Children. Uh, yes, children, let's go to church. Uh, we want to bless our children as they go to the ministry, and we just thank you for the servants who provide service to our children. We just bless our children this morning, Lord God. We thank you for the blessing they are in our lives and that we, they're here with us for just a short time so that we can raise them in, in the fear of the Lord, that they would know you, love you, and serve you all the days of their lives. We pray, Lord, as they go into this ministry, that the word be planted deeply in their heart, that they would grow into oaks of righteousness to, as a display of your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go conquer the world, guys. Wow. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, we've been talking about new beginnings since January 1st, and we've been talking about the desert experience. Today, we're going to talk about altars in the wilderness. Um, for those of you who are new, let me uh, introduce a dear, dear family that has come to us from Kentucky and... Thank you. Kansas City, and that would be Cameron and his gorgeous wife, Erica, and two of their four children, Eden and Matthew. And uh, they're just a super blessing, and they're here to check out the school and, and, and actually just to get to know us, and we're very excited to have them. So, you know, when we're finished with the church, we want to give them a warm welcome. Uh, you know, no matter what we're going through today, we know that Jesus is here. Just because he said he would be, we have to believe him. So we thank you, Lord, for being here in our midst because without you, we're nothing. We've been talking about this for now, let's see, over a month. Every day is a new beginning. Today is the first day of, your, of the rest of your life. No matter how bad you messed up yesterday, God's mercies are new every morning. And I'm just very grateful for that because, you know, we get saved and it's just a journey. Our life is a journey of, that leads us through the desert or what we call the wilderness experience. And we have to go that before go there before we can enter into the promise that He has for our lives. And thank God we have a guide. Jesus is our guide. The Holy Spirit is our guide, and He leads us one step of obedient faith at us at a, at a time. And thank God He will never leave us, nor will He ever forsake us. We might walk away from Him, but He'll never walk away from us. Because He is our only hope. He is our only salvation as we face the giants and the mountains that block our path to victory. So, <clears throat> very quickly, I'm going to go over. We've been talking about in the lives of um, Abraham, Joseph, David, and Moses. We saw that this walk, uh, this journey can last for years and even decades before we enter into the place of authority that God has prepared for us because that's really what he's doing. He's preparing us for authority in this earth and in the kingdom to come. We have also seen ourselves in the lives of the Israelites as they entered into their desert experience. And you need to remember that they were an idol worshiping nation. God chose them, this nation, to show his glory to the rest of the world. Yet, in spite of all the incredible miracles that they saw in the plagues of Egypt, in their own um, crossing of the Red Sea, which, by the way, represents baptism, when they saw the Egyptian army slaughtered in the sea, they walked on dry land. Even though he provided food and water in the desert, even through a rock, they continued to be an obstinate and rebellious people. And that trip that should have lasted only three months ended up being a journey of 40 years, just long enough for every one of those obedient, disobedient Israelites to die in the desert. Now, you and I, we're just like the Israelites. God delivered us from the death angel when we put our faith in the blood of the Lamb. We ate from the tree of life when we received into our hearts Jesus, who is the Passover Lamb. He also delivered us from the demonic forces that seek to control us and keep us captive to sin and death. But that's just the beginning of the journey. Like the Israelites, God takes us into the desert or the wilderness experience for a purpose. And this is the purpose found in Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4. Remember, there's a reason why you're going through what you're going through. Believe me. 
Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. He led them and he leads us for a purpose to humble and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. You know, 15 centuries later, when Jesus was 30 years old, he was ready to begin his public ministry. Almost. He had to first go through his own Red Sea experience. We find that in Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17, when it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee, where he lived, to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Remember, he's our example. So he is showing us the way, one way, one step at a time. And then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, as soon as he was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he showed, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. That represents the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, God the Father made this proclamation that Jesus was his son. When you and I finally gave our life fully to the Lord, our spirit was made alive within us. His Holy Spirit enters into our hearts and begins the work of transforming us into the image of Christ. Our baptism in water is an out outward expression of the inward work of the Holy Spirit. But that's not all. A new birth is announced in heaven. And the angels throw a party to celebrate every time a sinner repents and comes to Christ. There's a party in heaven. Just like you would when you have a baby here. You have a baby shower, you know. God has a new baby, and you and I are his child We are his children and members of his royal family. Praise God. But there's more. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus to empower him to do the work of the ministry he was called to do. I can tell you I've never seen anyone who was not spirit baptized ever perform a miracle. And in my opinion, most of the word that goes forth from pastors today is from the cerebral to the cerebral. You cannot reach the spirit of man unless it is the spirit speaking. And so if you want to be used by God in the way that God's calling you to be used, you need to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you have not received it, if you have not received that anointing. But this is how it was with Jesus. The Holy, Jesus had the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Spirit of God, but he needed the anointing. Before he started his ministry and he was 30 years old, he has a lot in common with a lot of people like Joseph, who was 30 years old when he started his ministry. (laughs) Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11 tells us then Jesus, right after his baptism, right after the Holy Spirit comes upon him, God announces, this is my son. I'm very happy with him. Then he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I would think so. The tempter came to him and said, Excuse me. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones, tell these stones to become bread. And he could have done that. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, again, he's keeping, he keeps challenging this thought. If you are the son of God, prove it. 
He said, if you really are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Man, the devil knows the word of God too. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to him. That's a good place to be. Jesus leads us by example. In every single test, Satan challenged his sonship. If you are the son of God, prove it. Use your power and position to serve yourself. And it's the same with us. Jesus passed every single test with the word of God. And that's the way we pass our tests. The enemy comes, deception comes. He tells us to do something and mostly to use our position as children of God and the gifts and talents he's given us to enrich ourselves, to lift ourselves up in the eyes of man in one way or another. But when we know the word of God and it's not mental, it's here, we know that's not from God and we can respond with the word of God and the enemy must flee. The Bible says, resist Satan and he will flee. But there's more. Matthew 4, verse 10 is a repeat. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. The wilderness experience is where altars are built. Believe me, when you're in the desert, when your finances are falling apart, when everything is crashing in around you, you are in the desert experience the wilderness experience, and you are being tested to see if you will obey God. It's the place where idols are burned to ashes and obliterated. It's the place of total surrender. It's a place where hearts are made clean and free from all debris, from the love of money and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Altars are also the place of true worship. Isaiah 29 verse 13 tells us that the Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And Jesus later on, centuries later, he in righteous anger repeated those words to the Pharisees. He said in Matthew 15 verse 7 through 9, he said, You hypocrites! You hypocrites. <laughs> he wasn't politically correct at all. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. He also said in John 4, verse 23 and 24, he says, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. There's a whole sermon in that. A whole sermon What does this mean? What does it mean? Well, let's go back to the Israelites in the desert. They had to face their giants when the Amalekites showed up to wreak havoc on God's people. We saw that last week. When they were defeated by Joshua, Moses built an altar. And that's found in Exodus verse, chapter 17, verse 14 through 16. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it. 
because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner, he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. You know what? If you are a child of God, you are God's possession. You are his anointed one, you, and your enemy is his enemy. And don't ever forget that. If you belong to God, your enemy is God's enemy. Because you belong to him. Now, why is that important? When this reality is planted deeply in your heart, you will build an altar. A place of worship in your heart. And here's why. Moses built this altar to worship Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner, mighty warrior, victory. A banner is a flag. You know what? Banners and flags are important. We have banners here. Every one of them lifts up the name of Jesus because our allegiance is with him. It's not to the rainbow flag. And honestly, it's not even to the American flag. It's to the king of glory and to his kingdom that we pledge our allegiance. Now, as a servant to God, we are good citizens of the United States of America, I hope. And if called upon to fight a real enemy, not one that's been enticed to attack us it, like it's happening now, we would gladly fight for our nation. Probably not today. But there is a time when our nation was at, at, at war with a real enemy. And we fought that war boldly and courageously. But Jehovah Nisi is our God. He is our mighty warrior who defeats every enemy and gives us the victory. So when we trust and obey him, he fights our battles for him. There is an if. There is if we obey him. If we walk in obedient faith to him, he fights our battles for us. And we can rest in the assurance of his love for us. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. And because of that, we win. Now, this altar that Moses built came after a great victory over the massive army that had come to kill, steal, and destroy. This altar that we build in our hearts is where we lay down our arms and we place our trust in the name of the Lord, Jehovah Nisi. Jesus is our mighty warrior. This altar is where we defeat our greatest enemy ourselves, our self-will, our self-sufficiency, our selfish ambition, our narcissistic ideals. We crucify those. We place them on the altar because you cannot worship God in spirit and in truth while you're serving yourself. Our greatest enemy is put to death and we win. Amen? Amen? can't win any other way. So shortly after this, uh, well, once you do that, by the way, that's when God gives us the victory over sin because our greatest enemy is ourselves and it has to be put to death. Now, shortly after this victory, God gave the people of Israel, he, t he led them to Mount Sinai where he gave them the Ten Commandments and he began with these commands. It's not all of them, but Exodus 20 verse 1 through 6 starts with, and God spoke all these words. God leads his people through the desert to the place of worship and he goes to Mount Sinai where he gives them the law and he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in, any, in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments, who love me and keep my commandments. It's not who love me. The reason we keep his commandments is because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Amen. It's not hard when you love God. Those who are, those, you know what, guys, those are serious words because um, God's, it's, it's serious because God is, a, is jealous. He's a jealous God. When I was a baby Christian, the Lord got me, I went to a Christian bookstore. The Baptist bookstore is the only one in town at the time, 1980. And uh, I know, it's a long time ago. There was a book about that thick, and it was really like the Reader's Digest condensed version of the Bible. That's not what it was called, but that's really what it was like. And it was written in a way that a teenager could understand it. It wasn't like a two-year-old could understand it, but a teenager. And I read it, and, and the one comment, I read it. It was from Genesis I, I, through Revelation. And I read that, and I thought, wow, God is jealous. Man, as long as the people did right, they were blessed, but then when they would start worshiping idols, say, oh boy, that's bad news. Hell's coming to breakfast. But he is jealous for our hearts, and we owe him our total allegiance, our total devotion, our total commitment, and our worship. He won't share it with anyone. When you ask me, are you a fan of? No, nope. I'm a fan of Jesus. In fact, I'm a fanatic for Jesus. I don't care about anybody. I don't care. I don't care. It means nothing to me who wins the Super Bowl today. I know that might upset some people. No, you're not. I am. I'm his favorite, not Bill McCombs. Okay, just for the whole world to know. Okay, so listen. We owe him everything. But it does come with a cost. We must give up our idols. And where does that happen? We build altars. Jesus had an altar. It's called the cross. After giving his life in obedient service to others, he literally gave his entire body, his soul, and his spirit as a fragrant offering to his father in one last final act of, of worship. You see, obedience is worship. God gave the Israelites ex exact instructions for building altars in the wilderness. Exodus 20, verse 22 through 24 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. I love that song we just sang. Heaven comes to fight for us. Totally awesome. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Alongside. God and. God and football. God and money. God and drugs. God and sex. Don't put anything back. He's it's one or it's all or nothing. He says, "Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar. Here's don't make these idols, but make an altar. And here's how you do it: make it out of the earth for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle." Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. You don't want to meet God. You meet him at the altar. What did they have to put on that altar? Free will offerings, burnt offerings, their assets. Their, these are their assets. Their farm animals. They were what was laid on the altar. Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, his only son, the son of promise. 
He put on an altar and was ready to slay him, to kill him. And we all have something that must be put on that altar. Now let's, why? Why did God tell the Israelites to make it out of the earth? The altar out of the earth. Why? Because God created the earth. He's the architecture, architect and the builder of our faith. He is also the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the cornerstone and the capstone that holds it all together. He is the living stone the builders rejected. Unless God builds a house, man labors in vain. When man gets involved to make what God designed better, we destroy the power of the cross. Just look at the modern day church. <clears throat> it doesn't even resemble the book of Acts church that transformed the world in just three centuries. God forgive us. We think we can do it better than God. So God says, no, I don't want you to do this. Don't, don't you make it out of dressed stone. If you're going to use stone, because that's all you got, then only, you don't dress, don't, don't carve it and make it square or rectangle or mess with it. Don't put a chisel on it because you'll defile it, God says. You'll defile it. Altars are a place of sacrifice. Where there is no sacrifice, there is no worship. The Israelites were told to sacrifice sheep, goats, cattle. And then there were the free will offerings of wine and cheese, not really. Wine and oil and grain and the first fruits of their labor, of their harvest. And God's instructions throughout the Old Testament were explicit in every detail. If you've never read the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, I mean, everything is very detailed. The, the building of the tabernacle, the building of the temple. It was, every detail was covered. And God is in the details of our lives. Amen? God cares about the details, so we should too. So what does that have to do with us who are no longer under the old covenant, but we, are, we have entered in an, into the new covenant. I, don't, I, I really don't like Old Testament and New Testament. I like Old Covenant and New Covenant. Because we're in a covenant with God, a covenant relationship with Him. We need to understand what covenant means, but that's another message. But what does it mean for those of us who are under the new covenant that was signed in the blood of Jesus? You see, every covenant signed in blood. The old covenant was signed in the blood of animals, or actually it was uh, circumcision. Blood was shed when little baby boys at eight days old were circumcised. That was their, the sign of the covenant. They'd enter into a covenant relationship with God because of circumcision. Today, we enter into the covenant, the new covenant under, that was signed in the blood of Jesus. So... We're not bound by the, all the Levitical laws of worship in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. But we need to understand what it means to be in the New Covenant and how this relates to us. And, by, and that's why I chose Saul. He was a man chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to be, become the first king of the nation of Israel. Saul was a nobody from nowhere, but God chose him. And, an, and, and he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. 1 Samuel 10, verse 9, and 9 through 11 tells us about this. He says, after he had been anointed by Samuel, Saul turned to leave Samuel and God in an instant turned. He turned. And God changed his heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, these are the signs that were fulfilled. A, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this? that has happened to the son of Kish. Is Saul also among the prophets? I don't know about you, but when I got saved, when I got, really, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit is when the real change came. And my friends were like, whoa, who is this girl? I was this shy little kind of weird person. 
And all of a sudden, I'm on fire for God, and I can't quit talking about God. I cannot quit talking about Jesus. I'm like on fire, Dwight. I was on fire. Fire. Fuego. Fuego. Spanish. And you know what? <laughs> We're changed. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are changed. It's obvious to everybody around you. So, so somebody, so, and, and you're changed. Saul was a nobody, but now he was a king. He was literally a king. But, and you know what? That happens to us too. We're nobodies from nowhere, and all of a sudden, we're a king's kid being trained to be a king because he, Jesus is the king of kings. Guess who the kings are? Us. Amen. Little K. Little K. Guess why? Because when he comes at the end of the tribulation, seven years of tribulation, he's going to establish his millennial kingdom, and guess who's going to rule and reign with him all over the earth? Me. Me. I'm his favorite. I don't know if he's going to give me a beach town or the mountains, but I, I'm okay with whatever. I just really want to be on the front row to worship him. And that's the way it is with us. One day you're nobody. Today you're a child of the, of the king, a member of his royal family. But Saul had a problem. He lived in constant fear which caused him to disobey the direct command of God. And we find that in Samuel had, after this anointing, he told him, look, go down to Gilgal and wait seven days. I'll be there and then he'll make an offering, okay? First Samuel 13, 1 through 14 tells us what happened. Saul, oh, by the way, Saul was 30 years old. Do you see a common denominator here? 30 years old when he became a king. That's how old I was when I got by when I became a king. Well, how old I was? I'm not saying you can't be one earlier, but. And he reigned over Israel for 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan, his son, at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba. Jonathan was a courageous young man. And the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So Israel heard the news. It was their form of um, emails and mass communication. Blow the trumpet. So all the Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Remember where Samuel was supposed to meet him there. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That's a lot of men coming to fight your little measly 3,000 guys. So they came, they went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. They hid in wells and pits in caves because they saw it was hopeless. It's never hopeless. Some of, some of the Hebrews even crossed the Jordan, the Jordan River, to the land of Gad and Gilead. They were running. They were running. Saul remained at Gilgal, Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited the seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought... Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. 
You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Out of fear... Saul disobeyed the direct command of God. Fear is the opposite of faith. Anything that is not a faith is sin because fear will always cause us to do the wrong thing every time. But it became a pattern for Saul. We see that in 1 Samuel 15 verse 1 through 23. I want you to listen to these scriptures because this is you and me. He's describing us. Samuel said to Saul, Samuel says to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Remember the Amalekites? Remember the word of the Lord? Remember what God said about the Malachites, going to wipe them off the face of the earth? God has a long memory. God does not forget what people did to you. So he says, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women Children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talim. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Now he's got a big army. Saul went to the city of Amalek. And set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, a group of people who were not enemies of Israel, he said to them, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. He couldn't believe it. How could you do this? I mean, I can imagine. I've been there. How could you do this? I've, I've, I've had that. I cry out all night about somebody who's done something very evil. How could you do this? He, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There, look at what Sam, Saul is doing at Carmel. It's a mountaintop. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. So he's gone to Carmel built an, a statue for, or a monument for himself. Great is Saul, King Saul. And then he leaves and he goes back down on, on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, Saul says to Samuel, the Lord bless you. Sounds like a good Christian. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, 
the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Sounds like a good Christian. Great intentions. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and dis completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord. I, I did. Saul said, I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. Aren't we like that? We make excuses for our sin. I did, God. I went on that mission trip. I did, God. I went to Bible school. I did, God. I did obey. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king, as proof. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. What's your problem, Samuel? Don't you understand? But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. What was the cause of Saul's disobedience? Fear. 1 Samuel 15 verse 24 through 31 tells us. Well, actually, then Saul said to Samuel... I have sinned. I violated the king's, the Lord's command and your instructions. Why? I was afraid of the men and so I gave in to them. It's only verse 24. And you know what? Saul is a tragedy. But he's also a picture of those in the church who walk in fear. Because they have never surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never live a life of obedient faith until you build your altar. Jesus made this very clear when he said in Luke 9, verse 23 and 24, he said, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will save it. You know what? God is not your co-pilot. We should hear that. I think there's a song about that. Take the wheel, Jesus, or something like that, right? He's not our co-pilot. He's either all or nothing. And we must get off the throne of our hearts, bow our hearts and surrender to the King of glory, and build an altar where we crucify, where we put to death all idolatry. Everything we treasure must be put to death. Our hopes, our dreams, our selfish ambitions, all of it must be crushed. Our desire for the praises of men our desire to be respected, to be honored. Our, because I'm going to tell you something. Every great man or woman of God has suffered persecution. The Bible says, if all men think well of you, beware. 
If you've never been persecuted, if people have never gossiped about you, if they've never treated you with contempt, there's a good chance you're not on the path that God has planned for you because the enemy doesn't need to mess with you. Right? That's the way it is. We have to crucify all the offenses we've allowed to take root in our heart. We have to crucify all the bitterness and unforgiveness that's been harboring in our lives for centuries. (laughs) We've got to give it all up. And that's what it means to worship. To put to death all idolatry. Everything we treasure must be put to death. Because we need to sacrifice our lives through obedient faith. You know... In the American church, we think that if we raise our hands in worship and we sing these songs, and they're beautiful songs, but if we do all that, it's worthless if we don't sacrifice our idols on the altar. Romans 12 verse 1 tells us what true worship is. Remember, altars are the place of worship. And Romans tells us, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. No matter how bad we mess up. How many times we fail you. Your mercies are new every morning. We ask, Lord, that you bring to our memory everything that keeps us from loving you with a pure heart. From worshiping you in spirit and in truth, Lord God. We are desperate for your presence. It's in your presence that we find fullness of joy. It's in your presence that the blessings overtake us. Lord, we know that we're all going through trials and tribulations in this life. And without you, we will be overcome. We will be overcome by the enemy. But God, we know that our enemies are your enemies. We thank you, Lord, that you fight our battles. God, we ask you to fight the biggest battle that we face. And that is our self. Let your kingdom come into our hearts and our lives. May you reign victoriously over every thought, word, and deed. That our lives may bring glory and an honor to your magnificent name. Use us as your vessels of mercy and grace in the earth, God. Change us from the inside out. Lead us to everlasting life, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.